we now begin our second part of Philippians and that is from Philippians chapter 1 verse 27 on to the end of chapter 2. And we look at it as the Christian mindset. The Christian mindset. In this section, you will find Paul will appeal to them. He will appeal to them to be united. He will appeal to them to be humble. And he will appeal to them to be holy. Of course, he will also give them examples, of course, of Christ, but another two wonderful servants of Christ. This is how he will talk about in this section. So, Paul is going to speak about the kind of thinking that God's people should have. What makes us Christian is not our name, but how we live and how we think. It's our Christian mindset. In fact, we will see some of the names that we have in, in Philippians are not what we tend to call Christian names. So what makes us Christian is not our name, but our mindset. And so Paul will say in chapter 1, 27 on to 2, 4, he will say, now that you are in the triune God, since you are in the triune God, he says, you must strive together for the gospel's sake. Work together. So there is an appeal to unity. You are in the triune God. When you read that section, 127 on, you will see how he talks about the triune God being involved. Friends, the central or the most important doctrine of the Christian faith is that God is triune. Our God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so God is in unity. One God, but in three persons. And if God is a team, how much more we should be together in a team? And uh, I sometimes would say things like, it's not a good idea to name a Christian ministry after one person, however gifted that person may be. Because we must emphasize that we are working together. So this whole thing that we must strive together for the sake of the gospel. And in 127, your translation will say something like, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. But Paul, as I mentioned earlier, uses a word of citizenship. He says, live like a citizen. He uses the Greek word politiomai. Live like a citizen of God, citizen of Christ's kingdom. And uh, in other words, don't live as just being part of this imperial system. Okay, you are in Philippi. You are like a mini Rome. You are very proud of your Roman citizenship. But far more important for you as being in Christ, live as citizens of Christ. And in verse 29 and 30, he tells them, Do you know you have a wonderful privilege in Christ? For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, we are not just believers, but also to suffer for him. <clears throat> Do you realize, friends, that is a privilege that you and I have. The privilege of suffering for Christ. And that is something Paul will talk about. And that is something that we have to bring our mind to think like that. That paying a price for Christ is one of the greatest privileges that you and I will have in this world. Just the other day, last week, we were reminded about this wonderful missionary. Okay, William Borden. B-O-R-D-E-N. Check that out. He was a great missionary. He is very young man decided he was from a very rich family in America and he decided to become a missionary to China. On the way, 
he went to Egypt and in Cairo, he got a very serious illness and he dies. He died at the age of 25. William Borden, go online, you can read about him. I mean, giving your life, that's a very different way of looking at life. To see that paying a price for Christ is a great privilege. Believers are offered the privilege of suffering for Christ. And Paul will ask for that privilege. Chapter 3, verse 10, when we come to that prayer. And so he said, being united in Christ, you are sharing in the Spirit, and you have common love, so be like-minded. Look at what he says, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Now, one of the key words, make sure you get this, one of the key words in Philippians is about thinking. Paul will use a verb, phroneo. Phroneo is a verb to think. All right? Ten times in this letter, we have the use of this verb, which is very significant because in the other letters, remaining letters of Paul, all the letters put together, that verb is used only 11 times. And in this short letter alone, he uses this word 10 times, meaning thinking. Christian discipleship. Jesus said you must love God with all your mind. It is our thinking that needs to change. Sometimes we tend to make people, you know, conform to certain external appearances. I remember 40 plus years ago when I became a young follower of Christ, there were some who would say your haircut must be Christian. Now I don't know what that Christian haircut is all about. Now I don't even have hair, so I don't need to worry about it. So we are so taken up with physical appearances, the color of the shirt we wear or something like that. Uh, whereas Paul is saying, it is in your mind. Remember Romans 12 too, be renewed in your mind. So it's all about thinking like Christ we are talking about. And then he talks about the mind of Christ. What is the mind of Christ? Chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So what is the mind of Christ? It is caring for other people's needs. It is caring for the needs of others, selflessness. The mind of Christ is focusing on the needs of others or placing the needs of others before your own needs. That's the mind of Christ. What is the Christian mindset? It is the mind of Christ. Just the mind of Christ. We need the mind of Christ. So chapter 2 verse 5 he says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Mindset. Phronesis. Your mindset. So what we need is not just external behavior, though that is important. Our mindset will come out in our external behavior. But we are called to have the mind of Christ. That is the Christian mindset. Now, what follows, friends, is one of the most beautiful passages in the New Testament. Chapter 2, verses 5 to 11 is a classic and a grand passage in the New Testament. Maybe we should read this many, many, many times till we get it. It is one of the most beautiful passages. But I want you to remember one thing. The purpose of this passage is not to provide a high doctrine of Christ. 
Christology. This is what it is. Though that we can learn from here. But it is given for them to live in a certain way. It is for what is called mimesis. Mimesis means imitation. This passage is about Christ so that we will imitate Christ in this way. As a model, the imitation of uh, Christ. Remember that famous classic, uh, The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Kempis. And so we need to understand that this beautiful passage we are going to look at very briefly, I wish we had more time, is for us to learn from, to imitate. Sometimes I ask people, so why did Jesus come? We have good answers. Usually they will say, to die on the cross for my sin and things like that. Those are correct answers. But let's look at it in a different way. Let us first of all remind ourselves, why did Jesus have to come? First of all, and using here the language of John 1.18, Jesus came to reveal God the Father in a fresh way. See, we already had the scriptures till now, friends. The Hebrew scriptures were already there before Jesus came. We already knew about God, but Jesus came so that we will really get it. Ultimately, properly get it. Even to read what, how to read the Old Testament. You need Jesus to read the Old Testament well, especially as Christians. Of course, Jewish people who do not believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Lord, they read differently. We do have a different way of reading scripture. We follow Jesus and we read scripture through Jesus. Jesus came to reveal God the Father. Now, if I asked you, tell me something about God. God is, God is, God is. Generally, we will have answers like God is good. Yeah, especially after Don Moan, he told us, we say God is good and everybody says all the time. Yeah, God is good. God is love. God is, then we may use words like omnipotent, omniscient and things like that. All those are all right. But what we are going to learn in this passage is something that we don't normally speak about. And that is, God is humble. Normally we don't talk about God that way, right? We talk about people sometimes and say, that person is humble. Um, don't be in a hurry to decide who's humble and who's not. Just because that person spoke in a certain way or externally that person appears in a certain way. You know, we get fooled sometimes. And we say, what a humble person that man is. Well, check it out with his wife. <laughs> you see, Jesus, as I said earlier, came to reveal God to us. And in this passage, you realize God is humble. And you have a definition of humility here. Sometimes we look at somebody and decide whether their dress code, we decide are they humble or not. Look at that lady. Look at the red lipstick she's wearing. Mm, probably not very humble. <laughs> we look at externals, but Jesus is going to teach us what is humility. God is humble. He is the, you could call him the cosmic servant. I'm carefully using the word servant because in our time, at least a generation ago, my parents' generation, they used to use the word servant a lot. People who came and worked in their homes, middle class homes. Today, it is better to use other words like domestic help and helpers. Yes, but I am using the word servant. In fact, this classic example is speaking about God not just as a servant, but as a slave. Jesus becomes a slave. You look at chapter 2 verse 7, by taking the very nature of a slave. Can you think about God becoming a slave for us? That is the God revealed in Jesus. And chapter 2 verse 5 to 11 is such a beautiful grand passage. I think it deserves 
that we read it together. And go ahead and read it loudly along with me. Chapter 2, verse 5 to 11. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of his servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that is the name of Jesus, Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. In 2.7, you have this very interesting phrase translated here in NIV, rather he made himself nothing. Some versions will use the word, he emptied himself. You may even hear a word like the word kenosis. Sometimes people will use that. It is coming out of a Greek word of emptying. What Paul actually says here, he is using a form of a verb, Ekano-o. Ekano-o is to empty. He is using the aorist form of that. He emptied himself. But what does that mean? What does it mean by emptying yourself? And I think rather than try to figure out what did he empty himself of? Of course, when Jesus became human, the limitations of being human were part of Jesus' life. Whether it is you can only be in one place at one time, whether it is limitations of what you can do, limitations of knowledge, all those were limitations the moment Jesus became human. But what did he empty himself? One way to think of it, think of a, a glass of water. That you empty it means you pour it out. And so, one way to understand Jesus emptied himself is he poured out his life as a slave. That's what we talk about the kenosis or the emptying of Jesus. He poured out his life in humble service. Humility is not shown in our external appearances or let me say it not necessarily through that but it is shown in an attitude of sacrificially serving others. That is humility. That's why in 2.4, Paul will say, not looking to your own interests, but each to the interests of others. Uh, just before that it says, in humility value others above yourselves. Some versions may say, think of others better than yourself. And uh, that may not be so helpful when you look at somebody, you're trying to be humble and you say, no, you are better than me. <laughs> uh, it's possible that you may be better than somebody else in something. No use of telling them, no, 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 you are better. It is not about who is better. The act of humility is when I choose to put the other person's interests before my interests. That's the act of humility. So Jesus poured out his life as a slave. What did he do? In the image there on the screen, you have seen Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. That was so unexpected that disciples could not handle it. Peter said, no, 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 you can't do that. <laughs> Jesus said, you don't understand what I'm doing. This also symbolizes I'm going to give my life for you. And unless you accept my giving of my life for you, Peter, you cannot be part of me. And when Jesus does that, remember he is showing to us God. Can you think about God of the universe washing our feet? That is 
who Jesus came to reveal. That is our God. So what we read here is, as God, he became a man. As a man, he became a servant. And as a servant, he gave his life. Went to the cross. Think about the shameful horror of the cross that Jesus went for. That is humility, friends. Where you give your life for the other. Now, why is all this being said? Chapter 2, verse 5. In your relationships with one another. This is for how we relate with people. This is not just so that we'll get a very high Christology about Christ. It is how do we live with people? If we are Christian, we are called to live in service of the other. Wash their feet. And as a result, we read in verse 11, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name. Now what is the name that is above every name? We would say it is Jesus, right? Mm, not really. By the way, when you're reading this passage, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you see this verse is an echo of a passage from Isaiah. Isaiah 45, 18 to 24. In other words, you will find several such echoes of scripture in Philippians. And this is one clear echo from Isaiah 45, 18 to 24. There, in Isaiah 45, Adonai, the word for Lord. Remember, the Hebrew people never pronounce the four letters. Yod, He, Wow, He. Those four letters are never pronounced by the Hebrew people. They will just say Adonai, Lord. Or Israel's Savior. He declares that He is exalted over all gods and other nations. And every god and every nation, everyone will bow to Him. That is the passage in Isaiah 45. Now that same status is being conferred to Jesus. He is called Lord. So when we hear Lord in the New Testament, remember, it is the same status as Adonai, the Lord, the God of Israel in the Hebrew scriptures. Friends, this passage is given to us that we too are called to serve like our servant king. Servant king. This is who we are called to be. This is our God, the servant king. He calls us now to follow him. I love this beautiful song of Graham Kendrick. To bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant king. If you don't know that song, go on YouTube and uh, listen to that song of Graham Kendrick. This is our God, the servant king. He calls us now to follow him. To bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant king. It's a beautiful hymn. Go online and learn it. My favorite. We too are called to serve like this servant king. We now come to chapter 2, verses 12 to 18. And if we like to summarize what this passage is, it is, be holy. Be holy. Chapter 2, verses 12 to 18. And in this passage, Paul will say things like, in verse 12, he will say, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God 
who works in you. Now, it's very important that we don't misunderstand this passage. There is no karma marga here. There is no do your own salvation business. Work out your own salvation. Basically, what Paul is saying is to the church, and this is not just individuals, there is a mysterious co-working of God and believers as a church. God is working in us. Did you notice what it says? For it is God, verse 13, who works in you. God works in us, but yet we also work and respond to God in this beautiful process of sanctification, submitting to God's purposes. And so Paul is encouraging the church to work along with God, with what God is doing in our lives. And then in verse 14, he talks about do everything without grumbling. Remember the people of Israel? Grumblers in the wilderness do without grumbling. And then he says, shine in this dark world by holding out the word of life. Now, I want you to notice when you read this carefully, you will find several echoes of scripture. Observe these echoes of scripture. Uh, I have given you a few references there. Deuteronomy 32 verse 5, Daniel 12 3, Isaiah 65 verse 23. You will find these references not quoted but echoed. Very interesting. Remember Paul's Bible? He doesn't have the New Testament. His Bible is what we call the Old Testament. And so he's thinking about the Bible all the time. And that comes out in his writing. Actually in 32 verse 5, Deuteronomy 32 verse 5, Israelites are spoken of, God's people are spoken of as a warped and crooked generation. They are a warped and crooked generation. But here Paul says the world is a warped and crooked generation. Very interesting use of that imagery. And Daniel chapter 12 verse 3, he talks about some will shine like the stars. That language is also there in verse 15. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. You see the echo from Daniel. Also Paul says, I want to be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. That is an echo from Isaiah 65, 23. So beautifully in this passage, Paul is emphasizing the fact that we need to uh, grow in holiness and live in a certain way in this world. So Paul wants his beloved church to be pure and blameless. Why? So that one day he can boast on the day of Christ. There's an interesting imagery that you find here in verse 17. Some people misunderstand this because Paul uses the word, even as I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith. Some people talk about being poured out that Paul is going to die. Not really. What Paul is doing here, he is talking about his life as a drink offering poured out along with the sacrifice of the Philippians. Now, if you want to understand this, you'll have to look at a passage like Numbers 15 and verse 5. Numbers 15, 5, you have a very interesting combination sacrifice. There is one main sacrifice, but on top of that, you pour out some, uh, a drink offering. So the burnt offering and the drink offering become one complete offering before God. Very interesting. So what Paul is saying here is, to the Philippians, your sacrifice is the main sacrifice and I am adding on my life as a drink offering. Together, we are a partnership that is beautifully offered to God. What an amazing, beautiful image of partnership that you have. You see that? It's Old Testament sacrificial language. Their sacrifice plus his life as a drink offering together is a beautiful sacrifice to God. Now we come to the last part very quickly from verse 19 to the end of this chapter. And in this, Paul will speak about matters of mutual concern between them. So he will talk about 
now i hope in the lord jesus to send timothy for you he is going to talk about two wonderful models worth emulating exemplars of humility and holiness who are these two two beloved people one we are very familiar with that is timothy timothy and epaphroditus big name mr e by the way a short form of epaphroditus is the name epaphras you will read about him in a certain letters of paul especially in colossians why are they mentioned also for mimesis remember mimesis imitation we talked about jesus here imitation paul even though he doesn't specifically say follow me he has already talked about his life he's pouring out his life and now he talks about timothy and epaphroditus a quick word about these two and then we will be done timothy first of all one thing that he says timothy will come soon to see you because paul says i will follow up so paul is expecting to be released he is not expecting to die here he thinks he is going to be released and so he says but i will send you timothy and then he praises timothy he talks about timothy they said like a son with his father he has served me timothy has served me as a father son relationship and he says there is no one like him he says verse 20 who will show genuine concern for your welfare for everyone looks out for their own interests not those of jesus christ of course this is when he bursts into hyperbole overstatement it's not like nobody else except timothy in the world is concerned for others no but it's a way of speaking that timothy has this unusual uncommon genuine concern for others this is the highest praise you can get from paul he says there is no one like him what a beautiful example to follow because he has genuine concern for the other that's timothy for you and then he talks about epaphroditus epaphroditus is the bearer of this letter as i mentioned to you earlier epaphroditus would have been part of a team of maybe two three people who came all the way from philippi to paul in prison probably rome and to take care of him and bring these needs but on the way he became very sick almost died so he could not go back now when he could not go back others who came with him went back and now the family of epaphroditus and the church is worried because remember unlike our time when you can tell them exactly what is happening with you they have no way of knowing whether he is dead or alive so epaphroditus became so sick paul says he almost died and yet now he has become well and paul is sending him back and he is sending this letter back with him as i mentioned earlier interestingly his name means dedicated to aphrodite or to love or beauty and why does paul say you should honor such people he says he risked his life for the sake of paul and the gospel he risked his life for the sake of the gospel because he came to take care of paul and he became so sick and he said such people must be honored in the church you need to honor such people now one of the things that you notice if you read carefully he says in verse 27 indeed he was ill and almost died but god had mercy on him and not on him only but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow what i notice from this is paul's view of healing physical healing it's helpful to notice these things there is another place in second timothy when paul will say i left trophimus sick at miletus what does that mean i was with him trophimus was very sick and when i left also he was still sick you know there are sometimes people say you just have to declare decree and declare you're healed Paul doesn't say and I decreed and declared and Trophimus is healed. He says no he is still sick. You think he would not have prayed? Of course he prayed. 
We read about other times Paul has raised the dead. He has prayed for Eutychus. He came back to life. So he believes in miracles. He believes in healing. And he prays. But he does not carry healing in his pocket. And he is just so relieved and grateful to God that God healed Epaphroditus. Which means there was a possibility that even with Paul around with his prayer, he could have died. It's good for us to know that. Otherwise, I think we can sometimes go off tangent. There is no overconfidence in his healing abilities. He is just grateful God heals. He has seen healing, but he does not carry it in his pocket. Just to notice this. Two beautiful examples, apart from the example of Jesus and Paul. So this chapter focuses on the Christian mindset of unity, humility. When there is humility, there is also unity. And humility is shown in service to others. And holiness and two beautiful exemplars for us. So the call on our lives, the call on our lives is to be like Christ in our thinking, to have a Christian mindset. May God help us to think Christianly. I have the mind of Christ. Amen.